And everybody said, Father, we thank you tonight for our leaders. Thank you for our pastors, our overseers, and all our people who are here. And those who are listening, Lord, I'm praying that today you revive your people in Jesus' name. Give us the tongues of the learned and the tongues of real ministers so that, Lord, when we speak, heaven will pay attention. When we speak, demons will move away. And when we speak, your power will be released upon your people in Jesus' name. Open the pages of the scriptures to us. Make us different men, different women, different ministers. And let our tongue have the touch of heaven in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Did I hear a ministerial amen? We're coming to James chapter 3. In James chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Look at verse 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire, kindness. Look at verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Verse 17, for the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. We're looking at the chapter today and the message is the untold power, incalculable power, great power, unknown power, the untold power of tamed and untamed tongues. Two kinds of tongues. Tamed tongues transformed tongues, controlled tongues, tongues that are reserved for speaking good and for doing good and bringing blessings upon life, tamed tongues. And then uh, there's another kind of tongue, untamed tongues. And those ones that are untamed, they also have some power, although it's a negative kind of power. And so we're looking at both sides tonight. Number one, the untold power of tamed and untamed tongues. The untold power of tamed and untamed tongues. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the destructiveness and damnation of loose, untamed tongues. The destructiveness and damnation of loose, untamed tongues. Number two, the deceitfulness and duplicity of lawless, undependable tongues. The deceitfulness and duplicity of lawless, undependable tongues. Point number three, the decisiveness and destiny of liberating unblameable tongues, the decisiveness and destiny of liberating unblameable tongues. Number one, the destructiveness and damnation of loose, untamed tongues. Let's come to chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters. It's not telling us to stop teaching or to stop being leaders and ministers, it says, be not many masters. Check up on your tongue before you teach, and cleanse that tongue before you teach. 
take the talk back to Calvary before you teach, knowing that we shall receive greater condemnation. That is, if our tongues uh, do not minister according to the word of God, and we do not minister grace to the hearers, there will be condemnation for many things. We offend all. If any man offend not a word, the same is a perfect man. That means then uh, it's very easy to be perfect. If you will just watch your tongue, if you'll control your tongue, if you bring your tongue under the control of the Spirit of God, perfection will come. Because it says, if any man offend not in words, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Because the tongue is the gateway into our lives, into our body, and into everything that we have. Think about it. Everything you do in life, the tongue is involved. And it says, if we're able to bridle the tongue, then the whole body will also be under control. Behold, we put beads in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. It's a little bead that we put in their mouth. It's actually to check them. If you want them to go the right way to the right, you pull that thing, it pinches them, and they know they are to turn to the right. And the same thing if they are taught to turn to the left. Today, at that time, the horse uh, was, um, all those animals were animals that moved the people around. Today, we are not using horses in many places to move around. We use a car. We use a lorry. And uh, if you're going to move a, a great equipment, heavy equipment, you might choose truck. And there's a little steering. That steering, in comparison with the whole body of the lorry, is very small. And yet it is that steering that turns the vehicle all in the direction it ought to go. It says, behold, also ships which though they be so great, that is the ships that uh, sail at those times, and even at this time now, very great in size. It says they are driven of fierce winds, although the winds are there, tossing them up and down, driving them here and there, yet are they turned with a very small hem, whithersoever the governor listed. It says even so. The tongue is a little member and boosts great things. The tongue is a little member. As you compare the tongue with your arm, the tongue is a little member. As you compare your tongue with your feet, the tongue is a little member. As you compare your tongue with your whole head, the tongue is a little member. Compare the tongue with your tummy, the tongue is a little member and yet the tongue. Decides the direction of your life. The tongue directs the progress of your life. How great a matter a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. That is, the tongue not saved, not cleansed, not transformed, not changed, and it is connected with a dirty heart. It defiling heart because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It says the tongue is a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the cause of nature. And it is set on the fire of hell. It leads the whole man the wrong way. It leads the whole man down the drain, the tongue uncontrolled, the tongue undependable, the tongue untamed, the tongue not transformed, the tongue of the unsaved man, the tongue of the backslider, the tongue of the carnal, and the tongue of the one that is careless in life drives him to hell. It is set on the fire of hell for every sin, every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind but the tongue can no man tame education alone does not tame the tongue civilization alone does not tame the tongue 
And being a man of position, a woman of position, does not tame the tongue. Being a man of wealth, a woman of wealth, alone does not tame the tongue. Even religion alone by itself does not tame the tongue. But the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And as you see when it says, we shall not be many masters. It says, we should not, uh, you know, be many teachers, many counselors, and many advisors, and many people that will just jump into the ministry, and then they begin to minister. The tongue is very important. Come to Job chapter 42. I'm reading from verse 7. Job chapter 42, verse 7. And it was so. That after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said unto Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee, and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the sin that is right as my servant Job has. You remember the friends of Job? They thought they were counseling. They thought they were teaching. They thought they were revealing knowledge. And they even told Job, they said, Job, listen. Don't argue. We're telling you what we're sure of. And they said, we have searched this out, and we know it, and it is true. And at the end of the whole thing, God came to them and said, you have not spoken right. You jumped into the ministry of teaching, into the ministry of counseling, and judgment is coming. But look at how they were sure of what they were saying. I'm looking at Job chapter 5 and verse 27. Job chapter 5, verse 27. They said, Lo, this we have searched it. So it is. Hear it, and know thou it for thy good. That's how sure they were. That's how confident they were. They thought they were saying the right thing in all the things they were telling Job. And yet at the end of the book of Job, the Lord came to them and said, I'm angry at you. You didn't say the right thing concerning me, although you thought you were sure. How many people are thinking they're sure like that when they talk, when they preach, when they teach, when they minister? When they counsel, and they're so very sure, they say, look, if you don't hear what I am saying, you are forever lost. And yet, like the friends of Job, they jumped into the ministry without knowing what they were talking about. Come back to Job chapter 42. And I'm reading from verse 8. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks, and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept. Listen to this now. Lest I deal with you after your folly. Lest I deal with you after your folly. All the things they said to Job, all the counseling they gave to Job, all the advice they gave to Job, the Lord summarized everything, bundled everything together, and he said it was folly. In that ye have not spoken of me the sin which is right, like my servant Job. And that's why the Lord is telling us that we need to watch our tongue and we need to see what we're saying and to see that it's according to the word of God. Lest what we say will bring us into untimely uh, judgment. Let's uh, look at uh, Second Samuel. Second Samuel, I'm reading from chapter 1. Second Samuel chapter 1. And I'm reading here from verse 5. Second Samuel chapter 1, verse 5. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? He came to give information. David will like this one. David will appreciate this one. His greatest enemy has died. And Saul is gone. And Saul will not trouble him anymore. And I must very quickly take this information to David. Be not many masters. Don't be such in a hurry 
stay back, stand back, and think of what you are saying, and think of the consequence of what you are saying. Look at it in verse 6, and the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, saw leaned upon a spear, and lo, the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me, and he called unto me. And I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite, not an Israelite. And these are people, people who are not born again, who are not part of the Israel of God. This is how they come to tell stories. Stories that are not true because they're looking for the praise of men and they're looking for reward. Be not many masters. Don't be such in a hurry. I've had this, I've had this. I'm going to give the information to so and so. Look at verse 9. And he said unto me again, stand, I pray thee, upon me and slay me, for anguish is come upon me. Because my life is yet whole in me, so I stood upon him. That's a lie. He told a lie against himself because he was looking for something. Be not many masters. Look at the information you want to give. And be sure that this information is the absolute truth. It says, so I stood upon him and I slew him because I was sure that he could not live after that he was falling. Look at verse 11. Then David took hold on his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. Look at verse 13. And David said unto him, unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I'm the son of a stranger, uh -huh, an Amalekite. And David said unto him, How was thou not afraid to stretch forth thy hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. He died for the information he came to give. He died for uh, wanting to have the praise of men. He died for saying that he was the one that killed Saul. Be not many masters. Do not be such in a hurry. A carrying stories about this happened, this happened, this happened. How do you know that that thing happened? Don't endanger your life because it says we shall receive more condemnation. Look at verse 16. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth has testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. I have slain the Lord's anointed. But look at the real thing here now. Chapter 4, verse 10. Chapter 4, verse 10. That is Second Samuel, chapter 4, verse 10. When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings. David knew. He could see through the lie. He could see through the deception. He could see that the man just wanted to give him the information. And then he brought himself into the story, thinking that he's going to get something out of David. And I took hold of him, and I slew him in Ziglag, who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. I would have given him a reward for his tidings. Watch your mouth. Close that mouth. You don't have to say that thing. You don't have to spread any story. You don't have to bring, you know, this from this to that. 
because there is danger for the people that go around and they are telling what people want to hear. He came to tell David what he thought David would want to hear. Daniel chapter 6. In Daniel chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 6. Daniel chapter 6, we're looking at verse 6. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king, and they said thus unto the king, King Darius, live forever. Now they were going to say something that they thought this will be interesting to Darius and this will impress him and they all came together and look at what they were saying in verse 7 all the presidents of the kingdom and the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that, what's who, that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for such days, save of thee, except from you, O king, it shall be cast into the den of lions. They said, we're promoting you, and we're making you the supreme leader, and we're making you the supernatural king. We're making you the one that is so high, the most high. For one month, you'll stand in the place of God. And that flattered the king. And they thought, you know, isn't it a good thing that we even came out with something like this? And of course, they were after Daniel. Look at uh, verse 8. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore the king Darius signed the writing and the decree. You know the story. I'm just bringing out the point that it was with their mouth. They destroyed themselves. Look at now verse 24. In verse 24, and the king commanded, and he brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, their wives, and the lions had the mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces, or ever they came at the bottom of the den. It was their mouth. It was their mouth. They said, this and they said we're promoting the king and the king is going to be very high high up beyond and above any man and all the people in their realm in their kingdom they'll be talking to they'll be asking the king for whatever request they had that's the thing that brought premature death unto them i pray god will help you and you will not um, be like all these people we're reading about in Jesus' name. Did I hear any amen? amen? Look at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, and I'm reading from verse 19. Matthew 27, verse 19. When he was set down as Pilate on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. And the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The high priest, the chief priest. He told, they went to the multitudes. The multitudes knew that Jesus Christ was teaching right. They knew that Jesus was healing them. They knew that they had never seen any minister, any prophet, anyone like Jesus. In fact, they even wanted to make him a king. And they, well, they ran after him. When did you come here? And they wanted to make him a king so that he will be blessing them and healing them and providing for them. And these chief priests touched the hearts of the people. And they persuaded them. They used their tongues to persuade them that Barabbas should be released and Jesus should be destroyed. Verse 21, the governor answered and said unto them, Whether 
of the twain will ye that I release unto you. They said, Barabbas. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. See how they persuaded everybody. That same gift of persuasion they could have used in the right direction. And they could have used to make the people repent of their sins and turn to the Lord and bring them to righteousness and lead them to heaven. But no, they used their gift of good communication to persuade the people and they wanted Jesus Christ crucified. It tells us in verse 25, look at verse 25, then they answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and our children. And that's what came on them. They were all scattered, those people of Israel. 82 AD um, 70, their temple was destroyed and they were scattered all over the world because of the wrong use of the tongue of those uh, chief priests. And the people said, uh, this blood be upon us. Jeremiah chapter 50, and I'm reading from verse 6. You have the gift of communication, you see it aright. Don't lead other people astray and don't uh, persuade them to do wrong or to say wrong or to go in the wrong direction. Use your gifts, the gift of the tongue, uh, to make sure that people go in the right direction. Jeremiah chapter 50, I'm reading from verse 6. My people have been lost sheep. How? Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They persuaded the people to ask for the crucifixion of Jesus. And it is like that today. There are some people who are preachers in uh, many churches and many denominations. They have good gifts and they have wonderful gifts. They can be very persuasive when they talk. But you know, they persuade the people that is not necessary to repent. Already God has forgiven everybody. Christ died for everybody. And they persuade the people to remain in error. Other people, they use their gift of communication to say, well, already, once you confess your sin to the priest, uh, the priest has forgiven you. You're already on your way to heaven. He has given us the right that we forgive you. And once we forgive you, you are totally forgiven. They use their gifts to deceive the people and to make them go astray. Other people will say, there's no hell. Look at God. God is kind and God is merciful and God is loving. How can a loving God send anybody to hell? There's no hell at all. Other people will say, yes, there's punishment, of course. There's purgatory. You will go to a particular place for some time and then after you are purged in that purgatory, you will go to heaven. Eventually, everybody will get to heaven. And the people are persuaded and they don't want to hear any other thing. It says, my people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill and they have forgotten their resting place. They have forgotten their resting place. Let's come back to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. I'm reading now from verse 9. In James chapter 3, point number 2, the deceitfulness and duplicity of lawless, undependable tongues. James chapter 3, we're looking at verse 9. In verse 9, look at what it says. It says, Therewith we bless God and even the Father, and therewith we curse men. Can you see the duplicity there on the one hand? With the same mouth, they bless God. And with the same mouth, they curse men, which are made after the similitude of God. Look at verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. Those things are opposites. Blessing is not cursing. Cursing is not blessing. But it's coming out of the same mouth. 
the duplicity. Look at that verse 10. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Look at verse 11. Does a fountain send forth at the same place with water and bitter? Look at that again. It's the duplicity is emphasizing here. Sweet water and bitter water coming out of the same fountain. Verse 12. Can the fig, my brethren, bear only berries? He said, we expect figs to come out. Figs coming out. Oh, leaves coming out. That's the duplicity. Either vine figs. It says, look at this, a same tree. At the end, when you pluck something, you're not sure whether you're going to get fig or you're going to get vine. So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Salt water coming out and fresh water coming out. That's duplicity. And now he goes on in verse, look at verse 14. But if ye have bitter envy and strife, Bitter envying and strive. And you, are now, you say you've got the better covenant. And you've got the new commandment to love your brother as I have loved you. And yet there's bitter envying and there is strife. There's no fellowship. And there is no friendship. And I say no togetherness. And there's no unity. There's strife in your heart. Glory not. And lie not against the truth. This wisdom. This kind of wisdom, I have wisdom, I know how to deal with people, and I know who to love, I know who to hate. That wisdom is not coming from God. I know when to refresh people, and I know when to, you know, be very heavy on people. That's not the wisdom from God. It says this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and striver is, where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. It's telling us to examine ourselves. He has sent us out to gather. So people gather and they scatter. With their tongue, they gather people. And with the same tongue, they scatter duplicity. He sent us to build, but there are some people with their tongue, they build, they give us encouraging words, and they give us uplifting words, and they build, but the very next moment with that same tongue, they destroy what they are building. Some people, they heal by their tongue, by the encouragement, by their sympathy, but then, on the other hand, they hurt the same people they have been instrumental in healing. You cannot depend upon them. They are dependable and their tongue is lawless. There is no control. There is no principle. They heal and they hurt. They teach to be strong. When they teach and they bring the word of God and you hear that, you are strengthened because they teach to make you strong. On the other hand, they tempt to weaken. They tempt to weaken. The same person who is teaching and is teaching effectively and you're so happy that you have a teacher like that, on the other hand, it tears you down. It tempts you and it provokes you. There are people who support and, you know, when you want to do something, you're so happy, you go to them and they support you and they encourage you and they even enlighten you. They say, you can do it this way and this way and that way. After that support, with the same tongue, the same mouth, they sabotage. They sabotage and they cut corners and then you are wondering, what was the one supporting me? He was the one helping me, and yet he sabotages your efforts. Some people, they lift up. Even though they lift up, they also pull down. They are not dependable. And today, as you see them, when they are happy, and they know the words to say to you, it will encourage you. It will lift you up. And tomorrow something happens that you don't know what has happened, and they pull you down. 
Why is he like that? He's lifting me up and then later he's pulling me down. There are some people, they refresh you. They refresh you. And when you listen to them, how fresh everything is, but later they reproach you. There are people who endorse you. I want to do this. They say, count on me. Count on me. You are endorsed. And then you can carry that about and, you know, you know, so and so endorsed my effort and so and so endorsed my vision he said i am endorsed and then later the same person who has endorsed you will endanger you and then will put stumbling blocks in your way and when you hear what he tells other people about you you say that cannot be he endorsed me he was the one that said this and this but you know he says other things that will endanger and it is this duplicity that uh, the apostle is saying it should not be i pray the lord will cleanse us tonight the lord will cleanse us tonight and all the deceitfulness and duplicity of lawless undependable talks the lord will take away in jesus name Say amen for the church. Amen. Psalm 62. Psalm 62. I'm reading from verse 4. Look at them here. Psalm 62. We're looking at verse 4. It says, They only consult to cast down from His excellency the delight in lies. Look at this. They bless with their mouth, but curse inwardly. They bless with their mouth, but curse inwardly. Look at uh, Psalm 50. I'm reading from verse 16 and verse 17. Psalm 50. We're looking at verses 16 and 17. They are up, they are down. They are left, they are right. They are forward, they are backward. They heal, they hurt. They teach, they tempt. They preach, they provoke. Think about that. Look at Psalm 50, verse 16. But unto the wicked, God says, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? They're preaching. They're declaring the statutes of the Lord. Or that thou shouldest seek my covenant in thy mouth. They actually take the covenant of the Lord in their mouth. God is faithful. God is a covenant-keeping God. And God is wonderful. And God will do this and will do that. That's taking the covenant of the Lord in their mouth. Seeing thou hatest instruction and casteth my words behind thee. Look at the opposite. Verse 16, positive. Verse 17, negative. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, thou givest thy mouth to evil and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou seatest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. You know, outwardly and openly, they'll say nice, nice things, but in the private, they say something negative. Psalm 55, I'm reading from verse 21. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter. But war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn salt. You can see the opposite right there is the duplicity of an undependable, lawless person. Even though it might appear smooth and appear nice and appear good, appear merciful, appear peaceful, on the other hand, there is war coming out from the heart. Proverbs chapter 26. In Proverbs chapter 26, here we're reading from verse 25. Proverbs 26, verse 25. When he speaketh fear, believe him not. For there are seven abominations in his heart. He speaketh fear. He knows what you want to hear. He knows what you would like to hear. And therefore he says what looks right. What looks acceptable. And yet there are seven abominations in in the heart whose hatred is covered by deceit his wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation 
His wickedness eventually will be showed before the congregation who so diggeth a pit shall fall therein. And he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. A lying tongue hated those that are afflicted by it. A lying tongue, a deceptive tongue, hates the people that are afflicted by that lie, and a flattering mouth walketh ruin. Uh, let's look at somebody. And you see this duplicity we're talking about, Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22, and I'm reading from verse 18. Look at the statement of this man. Numbers 22. And we're reading from verse 18. In verse 18, this is what it says. It says, Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak will give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Words of consecration, no covetousness. And I don't want your money. I don't want your silver. I don't want your gold. God is my God. I cannot go beyond the word of my God to do less or more. Look at verse 38. In verse 38, And Balaam said unto Balak, Lo, I am come unto thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything? The word that God put it in my mouth that I shall speak. What a great preacher. What a dependable prophet. That's what you think. But keep on reading. Look at chapter 23. Chapter 23, verse 10. Chapter 23, verse 10. Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the false part of Israel. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. That's a spiritual man. That's what you think. He wants to die the death of the righteous and he wants my last end to be like the end of that righteous man. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, But Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told not I thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh, I must do. What a man, and what a spiritual man, and what a giant in the faith. That's what you'll think. Come to chapter 24. In chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 12. It says, And Balaam said unto Balak, Speak not I also to thy messengers, which thou sentest unto me, saying, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own mind. But what the Lord says, that will I speak. Well, that's the man. And as you see the man, he appears consistent and has been saying the same thing over and over. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, he has said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance and having his eyes open. I see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and the scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Seth. You see, it was even preempted to see the Lord Jesus Christ as the star, as the one that has the scepter. This was the man that actually saw great vision. But now, look at chapter 31. All those things we'll be reading. 
that this man was, you know, such a determined man and a man that did not have any covetousness at all. See what he did eventually. And then we're told in verse 8, chapter 31, and he slew the kings of Midian. A walk came out eventually beside the rest of them which was slain, namely Eva and Rechem and Zor and Ur and Reba, five kings of, of Midian and tell me the name, Balaam also the son of Baal, they slew with the sword. How come? That he joined the Moabites to fight against the children of Israel. And when those people were destroyed, he also was killed. Look at verse 16. Verse 16, Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam. Is the use of the tongue through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Baal. And there was a plague among the children, among the congregation of the Lord. When Balaam saw that he couldn't curse the people, and he had a good front, a positive front, and he said, I don't want your money, I don't want your silver, I don't want your gold. I don't have any covetousness. I'm all right the way I am. And whatever the Lord has told me, that's what I'm going to declare. And eventually, when he couldn't cause them, he said, but you know, Balaam, uh, let's come back now from the public. Don't let us, uh, you know, stay at the point of sacrifice. But I can advise you. If you want to get those people, and then you are going to pay me for this now because this is secret counsel. If you release your women and those Israelites, if they commit sin with those, uh, your women, God will forsake them. And very easily, you'll capture them and you'll destroy them through the counsel of Balaam. That's what Balak eventually did. And thousands of those people died. Look at the comment of the word of God concerning him. Revelation chapter 2. Reading from verse 14, Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 14, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast his stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. Look at the man that said, I don't have any covetousness. I don't want your money. I don't want anything. I am a man of the word. And only what the Lord has put in my mouth, that's what I'm going to say. Behind, he contradicted all that. There are people that say one thing in the open and they say another thing in the private. We're looking at Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 15. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 15. Which are forsaking the right way. And are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozo, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He actually loved the money, but was saying another thing. He was covetous, but was saying another thing. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. And the dumb are speaking with man's voice for bad the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they are leal through the lust of the flesh and through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error, while they promised them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. I pray you'll not be like that. I will not be like that. 
I said, I will not be like that. The Lord grant you abundant grace in Jesus' name. We're looking at Psalm 12, Psalm 12. I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Psalm 12, verses 1 and 2. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases. Godly man will be godly publicly and godly privately. Not many of them. He will say the right thing in the open and then say the same thing when there's no other person there. Not, not many people like that. Who will say the right thing when there's money and say the right thing when there's no money? Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering leaves, look at this, with a double heart do they speak. With a double heart do they speak. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And the people that are double-tongued, because they have a double heart, you will not be like that. The Lord will make you faithful, will make you sincere, will make you somebody that the Lord himself will say, I know him as a faithful minister. You'll be a faithful minister in Jesus' name. Point number three now, the decisiveness and destiny of liberating unblameable tongues. The decisiveness and destiny of liberating unblameable tongues. We're coming to James chapter 3. And I read from verse 13, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Verse 17, but the wisdom which is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy, Good and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. The and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. This wisdom God will give to you in Jesus' name. What's the characteristic of this wisdom? Number one, it's endued with knowledge. Endued with knowledge. Look at verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? And there can be no wisdom if there's no knowledge. Endued with knowledge. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We're looking at verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Reading from verse 1. Who is, who is as the wise man and who knoweth the interpretation of a theme? Who is as a wise man that knows the interpretation of a theme? You're a minister and you have wisdom from on high. It is wisdom that is endued with knowledge. The knowledge of the interpretation the right interpretation, the correct interpretation of the word of God. A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. The Lord will give you supernatural boldness. Look at Daniel chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 21. Daniel chapter 2. And we're reading from verse uh, 21. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, here's what the Lord is saying about a man that has the wisdom of God and is endued with knowledge. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise. He giveth wisdom unto the wise. What does that wisdom do? And knowledge to them that know understanding. Wisdom and knowledge. If you're going to have wisdom, the wisdom of a minister, 
the wisdom of a counselor, the wisdom of a teacher, and the wisdom of somebody who turns many people to righteousness. It should be wisdom that is endued with knowledge, the knowledge of the Word of God, of the proper interpretation of the Word of God. Let's come back to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, and we're reading from verse, uh, reading from verse 13 there. In James chapter 3, verse 13, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you, let him show out of a good conversation. Out of a good conversation. When you are having the wisdom, you'll use your tongue aright in conversation. And the conversation you have will turn many other people to want to know the Lord. Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 27. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ. Your conversation, your discussion, your sharing, and your interaction with people. And what you say with your tongue, your conversation will be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. Whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's what wisdom does. It gives you good conversation. And that good conversation is able to turn the hearts of people unto the Lord. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. The man will not come to church. The man will not hear the uh, gospel from the pastors, from the preachers. And the man says, I have my own church, traditional church, but it's not born again. And you are born again, and you have this wisdom we're talking about. It will affect your tongue. And then you will win your husband to the Lord by the conversation that you carry on in the home. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Let's come back to James chapter 3. In James chapter 3, it talks about verse 13, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you. Let him show of out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. The kind of wisdom that shows out in our lives through our talk is the one that is meek. You are concerning somebody you are helping somebody, you are restoring a backslider, and you are telling people who are argumentative, there's the meekness of wisdom. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. They're argumentative. But you have the wisdom that the Lord has given you. And that wisdom is able to counsel without argument. It's able to preach without argument. It's able to answer questions without argument. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. I pray God will give you this wisdom. You will increase this wisdom. Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, there will be the meekness of wisdom. Galatians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, brethren, If any man, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou be tempted. Lest thou also be tempted. It says, bear ye one another's bodies, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's what he expects of you. That's what he expects of every one of us. We're coming back to James chapter 3. In James chapter 3, we're looking at verse 17. James chapter 3, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, 
then peaceable. The wisdom that comes from above is both pure and peaceable. Pure and peaceable. You will not fight. You will not strive. If anybody is argumentative or is quarrelsome, is pugnacious, you're not going to take part in that. You're going to show that you are different of the use of your tongue. He abuses, he raises causes upon you, he contradicts you, he kind of uh, provokes you, but you're not going to respond to that. Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 18. Romans chapter 12. Verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Live peaceably with all men. Verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Dearly beloved, your preacher, your minister, don't use the pulpit to attack the people that are causing you problems. And they're causing you some real serious problems and they're trying to provoke you. And you see that you know that fellow is there and you can identify him live peaceably with all men. Everybody that comes to church, whether they like you or not, that's not the problem. Uh, the thing is, the Lord has given you a ministry for the people that like you, the people that don't like you, the people that love you, the people that hate you, the people who are talking behind against you. He's giving you a ministry of everybody to bring them out of that situation and to bring them to the Lord. Don't use the pulpit to attack anyone one, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. May God make us the doers of the word in Jesus' name. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm reading from this familiar verse, verse 14. For do peace with all men. Everyone, while you're on the pulpit, follow peace with all men. While you're counseling, follow peace with all men. When somebody is reported to you, a pastor, you know, so and so said such and such, so and so uh, said such and such about you, about your wife, about your children. And uh, okay, you say, I know how to get them. Don't get them. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Lord, the wisdom from above is pure and peaceable. Come back to James. In James, I'm reading here from chapter 3. James chapter 3, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, and gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits. Is uh, this kind of wisdom is gentle and merciful. You are a preacher, gentle and merciful. You are a brother, a sister, a father in the Lord, is a mother in the Lord. You are gentle, you are peaceable, and you are a counselor, and you are leading other people to the Lord. You are, you are pure, you are peaceable, you are gentle, you are merciful. We are looking at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, and I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom. He shall gently, gently, gently lead those that are worth young. You are going to be gentle. You are going to be merciful. It tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 7. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Reading from verse 7. It says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes a children. Gentleness will characterize your ministry, will characterize everything that you say on the pulpit and behind the pulpit. Gentleness, you'll be gentle on people and you'll be merciful over people. Come back to James chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 17 again. It says, but the wisdom, 
that is up from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits. Full of mercy and good fruits. And it says, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Without partiality and without hypocrisy. You're not thinking it's for my tribe. You're not thinking it's for my village. You're not thinking, you know, it's been my friend from the primary school. It's been my friend from the secondary school. You're not thinking, we went to the same university together. You're not thinking, you know, he used to help me. Anytime I'm out of pocket, he normally helps me. And because of that kind of help, whatever he does now, I'm just going to gloss over it. I'm going to overlook it. There should be no partiality and there should be no hypocrisy. I'm coming to First Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality, taking decisions not by partiality and uh, giving assignments to people not by partiality you're not thinking of any other thing if that brother can do it and that brother cannot do it you give it to the brother who can do that work that sister is capable that si that other sister she's good but she's not able she's not as capable as this you give to the one that is capable and you say you do nothing by partiality and then he says there should be no hypocrisy i say chapter 32 i say chapter 32 i'm reading from verse 6 i say chapter 32 reading from verse 6 for the vile person will speak villainy and his heart will work iniquity to practice hypocrisy it's only the vile person that practices hypocrisy and to utter error against the Lord. That's an hypocritical person. As somebody is asking a question, I'm going through this, I'm going through that, and I pray that God has not answered me. And in the answer he wants to give is uh, uttering error against the Lord. is accusing the Lord. is disrespecting the Lord to make empty the soul of the hungry. And he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. I pray that every form of hypocrisy the Lord will take away from you, from me, from us together in Jesus' name. We're looking at James chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 18. James chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 18. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. God will make you righteous. God will make you doubly righteous. And you will have the fruit of righteousness in your ministry in Jesus' name. Your life will be an encouragement. Your ministry will be an encouragement. And your ministry will uplift people in Jesus' name. What you gather together, the devil will not use to, to scatter it in Jesus' name. You'll be going up and up. And you'll be making progress in your life. And the fruit of righteousness will have effect in your life, effect in your family, and effect in your ministry in Jesus' name. And you'll be an inspiration, an encouragement to other people. And the people God uses you to encourage, you'll not be the one that will pull them down again in Jesus' name. A good, good amen. amen. Philippians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 11. Philippians chapter 1, verse 11. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Your fruit of righteousness will not be scanty. I said your fruit of righteousness will not be scanty. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. But I would ye should understand brethren 
that the things that happen to me have fallen out rather onto the fortress of the gospel. Everything that happens in your life will make you have progress in the gospel will expand your ministry and will make you reach out to more people in Jesus name so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palaces and in all other places look at verse 14 this will be fulfilled in your life and many of the brethren many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds when they look at what happens in your life and they look at your deliverance and they look at your freedom and they look at your courage and they look at the way you are still preaching the gospel even whatever might have happened the water that might have gone under the bridge many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear to speak the word without fear your life will raise up other faithful ministers as god has made you faithful that same faithfulness will pass on to the lives of other people in jesus name your tongue will be anointed your tongue will be empowered your tongue will be focused your tongue will be faithful and when you speak Heaven will respond to the words of your tongue in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That Lord, everything we've seen, the negative things will take away from our tongue, and the bad things will take away from our tongue, and the duplicity, the double a heart, you take away from our lives, and something good, something great, something transforming, inspiring, you will deal through me, you will deal through everyone, you will confirm it in your life in Jesus' name.